You guys know that I love context. And after yesterday's live stream, that was forever long. It's still up. It's timestamped if you guys want to watch it. It's not heavily timestamped, just like a heads up. But, you know, check it out if you guys are interested. I love div like diving deep into these these subject matters. I think it's so interesting how people perceive things. And there's, you know, everyone's going to be a little bit right. Everyone's going to be a little bit wrong. Everyone's going to have misinformation. Everyone's perception is going to be a little bit off. But the Frogan perception of her military comments is what I'm focusing on today. Again, we're observing. It's not about making excuses. It's not about promoting. It's about having a nuanced conversation that I think nobody is having because everybody's in their feels, which is so valid. Feelings are valid. I mean, you're not wrong for having feelings. I just think that it's kind of keeping everyone from having a good conversation that I would like to have. So let's have that conversation here on my channel because that's kind of the perk of my job. So the conversation surrounding Frogan and what she said about the military, I think we should start just for context for people who missed it or weren't here or maybe are going to come across this part of the live stream and they don't know the context. Let's just listen to it again with a new fresh ears and, and then we'll get into it. Okay, so here's Frogan currently banned on Twitch for actually the panel she did at Twitch, not technically this video. Even though Twitch says that veterans are a protected class, allegedly, as of right now, Twitch says they did not ban her for this comment. They technically banned her for her panel in making the hummus joke. I don't know. That's why the other people on the panel got banned with her, because they were all a part of it. All right, here's Frogan. I will never have any pity for any soldiers. U.S. military? Boo f who? I hope you get PTSD. And right there, it sounds pretty controversial, but I would just like to point out that every streamer has about a thousand of these takes every stream. So just streamer to streamer, if you start taking down people for saying things like this because you think it's the worst thing you've ever heard, there are going to be no streamers left. Like, all of the stuff we have said as streamers, there is just no way. All the stuff we've said just in, like, our friend conversations, there's just no way... This is genuinely the worst thing you've ever heard, especially since it is actually very common to talk shit on the U.S. military globally. The Internet is a global space. It's not an American space. The Internet is not here to make Americans feel comfortable. And it is very common for Americans and people around the globe to talk shit about the U.S. military. That is just very normal because I don't know if you know this, but the U.S. military has a boot on everybody's neck globally. Our bases are around the world. We are the superpower. I, I do the ones I do I the ones I'm like whatever about the U.S. soldiers are the ones that like acknowledge that like what they did was wrong they didn't know well back they didn't know back then. Whatever you're you're a good person in my book. I'm like a Tom. Thank you so much for the ten gifted. The, the the U.S. military that are like yeah like you know I did this back then but now I know it's wrong like I'm changed like imperialism this you don't deserve the PTSD. But like any other military you're joining them you're like oh my god I want my Camaro, no student loans, f you. I hope you get PTSD. And I hope you get no health insurance when you get back into in America. For those of you saying, like, it's disgusting to wish PTSD on people, I don't believe you. Like, I'll be real, I just don't believe you. I do not believe you have never in your life wished something on people in any manner and said it. I don't believe you because it's, it, it's impossible to have a human experience and not have a moment of anger where you say something about people, right? I just don't believe you. But if if you tell me you are consistent and you've never wished ill and continue to never wish ill on people, maybe I'll believe you. I just don't. Given how violent the world is, like given how our rhetoric is, you know, the way that it is. So I just don't believe you because it is reflexive of the like after 9-11, everybody wanted Iraq decimated because they're angry. After October 7th, they wanted Palestine decimated because they're angry. People do things. They say things. They might not mean it, but they say it out of anger, right? So unless you've lived an incredibly sheltered life where you've never talked to another human being, I doubt you've ever really lived in a world or had a reality where you've never wished like death on someone or ill or sick or karma. Have you ever said karma in the comments? Have you ever been like karma? Because that's what it is. That's what you're saying. Okay, you're saying karma, like that's what you, so from a human perspective, I think it's dishonest. But from a, like a more introspective perspective, of course, we don't want to wish ill on anybody, but it's very common to wish ill on people. And so we want to sort of deconstruct that, right? So even if somebody says like, I hope you get your karma, that's what you're saying. You're saying, I wish ill on you, you know? Oh, I, you, I hope you get everything you deserve. That's like a version of, wishing ill on people, right? 
So it doesn't matter. But allegedly the context of Frogan's stream, which I cannot look up because she was banned, but my chat was telling me the reason Frogan was saying this is she just got done reading an article from CNN about IDF Israeli soldiers who had bulldozed children and had PTSD from it. So I want to talk about it within that context because I think it's important. And I'm going to use Noah Sampson as the um, kind of the storyteller of this, this situation because he covers it, funny enough. Yesterday, his video went up about the situation. There is a CNN article going around basically talking about how the IDF has PTSD from bulldozing Palestinians and how they can't eat meat anymore because it reminds them of the bodies they saw in Palestine. And I just want people to understand why that could make somebody so angry that they might say something in a sassy manner on stream. Not saying this is exactly why Frogan reacted the way she did, but this was the context I was told from people who saw the stream. But even so, Again, it's not about Frogan. We're using Frogan to zoom out on our own lens and how we have a relationship with other people. If you've ever had road rage, if you've ever cussed at somebody, if you've ever told somebody to go fuck themselves, that's basically what we're doing here. Now, on top of it, I want to remind her, as somebody, again, I have family in the military. It's very common for a lot of Americans to know people in the military. Lots of soldiers are very anti-military. Lots of people feel the veterans are neglected. And I think that's just a fact that America neglects its veterans, that, that there's a lot of negatives to sort of joining the military in a lot of ways, right? So I want there to be an understanding of context of when I think the line is disrespectful, when I don't think it is. I don't think military people are better than regular people. I don't think they need extra respect more than anybody else. I think military people are just like anybody else. And when you murder someone, it's wrong, whether you're in uniform or outside of uniform. But we justify it when it's in uniform because we've been fed propaganda that violence against civilians makes sense when we're at war. And I just don't agree. I think it's always wrong. Right. I've already had this conversation with other YouTubers. I think it is always wrong to kill people, even if you're in uniform. OK, I understand why we do it. I can see your justification. I can even agree that the logic you use to come to that conclusion might be reasonable. But I do think it's wrong. And I think we do wrong things all the time in the name of justice. Right. So I think that's just a very human experience. But I just I want to put down my line. So I think there is a line to which it is disrespectful to talk about veterans in a particular way. I think Trump is kind of a great example of this. The way Trump talks about veterans is like disgusting to me. The way he mocked John McCain for getting captured, right? The way he recently reacted to a veteran whose funeral he promised to pay for, but now refuses to pay for it because he claims they're taking advantage of him. Here's the story from MSNBC, just in case you haven't heard yet. Here we go. Atlantic is out today with a new article quoting more of the racist, reprehensible things Donald Trump says behind closed doors, including comments about a murdered army private. I remember this story. In 2020, Private Vanessa Guillen, the daughter of Mexican immigrants, was killed by another soldier at Fort Hood in Texas. And this is what's crazy is right now the military is suffering from an insane amount of rapes and domestic violence charges. From people in uniform, there's a reason why we say be careful dating somebody in uniform, to, to be careful dating a cop, because these groups of people have some of the highest rates of domestic violence. So she was killed by another soldier, right? Texas. And at the time, then President Donald Trump publicly offered to pay for her funeral. But when the bill came, according to this report, Trump was furious, telling his chief of staff, Mark Meadows, quote, it doesn't cost 60,000 bucks to bury an effing Mexican. He turned to Meadows and issued an order, don't pay it. Later that day, he was still agitated. Can you believe, he said, according to witness, effing people trying to rip me off? The Atlantic reports that Trump didn't pay the bill. His campaign denied he made those comments. You, of course, can make up your own mind as to whether or not that sounds like something Donald Trump would say and do. Okay, so kind of interesting. The Atlantic is out. Pause that. So, you know, you can go after streamers all you want for saying sassy shit. But at the end of the day, like, tr tr like Trump is running for office and he has infamously made fun of military soldiers. And for people to chess a 60K, what the fuck? I'm going to be honest with you. Everybody, I don't know if you've been paying attention to funeral costs, but funeral homes are scamming people and they are charging people outrageous amounts of money to do funerals. People can't afford to bury their loved ones. So I'm going to be real. I don't know if it's unusual when 
coffins can cost anywhere from 10 to 30K. Do you know that? Do you know funeral homes are taking advantage of people at their most vulnerable? And that here was a billionaire saying he'd pay for it and he's yelling at 60K. Like that's the irony, right? So it depends on where you're being buried, but this is in, this has been a controversy in funeral homes forever, which is, you know, I'm a very big proponent of putting people in mushroom suits and putting them under trees. In my opinion, I think our dead should go back to the earth because we are of the earth, but that's my hippie perspective. Okay. Now I'm going to explain, this is what I was told. I don't know if it's exactly true because I couldn't look up Frogan since she's banned right now, but allegedly Frogan was reacting to like militaries around the world kind of saying like, oh my God, I got PTSD from basically committing core uh, war crimes. Look, the reason I am empathetic to military soldiers is because I think they're being taken advantage. I think all people in the military that are forced into a draft, I think all people that are used to kill other civilians or other people on the other side of the world or in their own country, I think people in uniform who are forced to like um, tear up protests or act violently towards their own citizens and brothers, I think all of these people are being taken advantage of. I think without a doubt, there are lots of people who become military who hate and have to live with the disgusting things they've had to do. I have so I have soldier after soldier after soldier who have told me stories about civilians they've had to kill in Iraq that they deeply regret, but you can never say anything because then you're un-American or unpatriotic. But the truth is, is that our military, the American military and the IDF are traumatizing their own soldiers without caring about the fact that in order to be traumatized by the things you've done, you would have had to terrorize other people. So they are terrorizing people and getting PTSD from it. So everybody is losing. And I think any reasonable and rational person would agree. Both of these things are bad. We shouldn't be terrorizing people and our soldiers shouldn't be getting PTSD fighting wars that are unethical, right? Like we saw that in Vietnam. We're seeing it now with the IDF. So CNN covered it in Israeli soldier's perspective on how he got PTSD and how these IDF soldiers are getting PTSD after they bulldozed over the bodies of Palestinians, how they can't eat meat anymore because of the images of the Palestinians' bodies that are etched into their memory, right? So here it is. Um, Noah Sampson's going to cover it. And the reason I'm going with Noah instead of telling the story myself is because I think it's important for us in this sphere to remember, like, Hassan and Ethan and all these people, they're not the only people on the internet. There's lots of quote, normal people on the internet and in our lives that would find this disgusting. That would absolutely say the military, regardless if it's Israel's or America's, is has done atrocities around the world, right? I don't think that's that big of a claim. So maybe you disagree with Frogan saying you should get PTSD if you're like a murderer. But it's just like the same thing as saying like a murderer should never see the light of a day. Like, oh, throw them into the prison without the keys. Like, that's what she's saying. And everybody has said that. So you have to be understanding in the same way that we're understanding of other people for being angry. We say things when we're upset. And at the end of the day, like, if you want to talk about being so actualized that you never say these things, sure. In practice, a person could get to that stage, but it's not going to be a streamer like Frogan. And it's not going to be an angry conservative who, you know, just got their son back from, you know, Iraq in a casket. They're going to be angry. They're going to be angry. OK, so again, we're observing. We're understanding where people are coming from. So let's let Noah tell us this story. Hello, viewers. Today, I'm going to read through an article from CNN called He Got Out of Gaza, But Gaza Did Not Get Out of Him. Israeli soldiers returning from war struggle with trauma and suicide. Why are we looking at this article today? Uh, well, I think it's a good example of the freakish framing that Western media is willing to adopt in an attempt to humanize perpetrators of a genocide, which is one facet of the normalization of said genocide. As we read, I want to pay attention to the language, the framing, the active and passive voice as these events are described, as the Gaza genocide is covered by CNN from the Israeli soldier perspective, from the apparently sad Israeli soldier perspective. There's some pretty horrific shit that gets cited in this article. I'll let you know before I get to that part. Afford I'm going to speed him up to 1.25, just so you know. 
Three-year-old father of four, Eloran Mizrahi, deployed to Gaza after the deadly Hamas-led attack on Israel on October 7th, 2023. The Israeli military reservist returned a different person, traumatized by what he had witnessed in the war against Hamas in the Strip. Six months after he was first sent to fight, he was struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder back at home. Before he was due to redeploy, he took his own life. He got out of Gaza, but Gaza did not get out of him, and he died after it because of the post-trauma, his mother, Jenny Mizrahi, said. The Israeli military has said it is providing care for thousands of soldiers who are suffering from PTSD or mental illnesses caused by trauma during the war. It is unclear how many have taken their own lives, as the IDF has not provided an official figure. So already there are some small cues as to the perspective that this is being uh, framed from. This soldier was traumatized by what he witnessed. Some form of harm was enacted upon him by something he saw, but had no direct participation in, apparently. We don't know what was witnessed at this point, and we'll see what it is, but just keep that framing in mind. One year on, Israel's war in Gaza has killed more than 42,000 people, according to the health ministry in the Strip, with the United Nations reporting that most of the dead are women and children. The war, long after Hamas killed 1,200 people and took more than 250 hostages, is already Israel's longest since the Jewish state was established. And as it now expands to Lebanon, some soldiers say they dread being drafted into yet another conflict. So notice there's no mention of who is actually being killed, just that a lot of people are being killed in this one place, and some participants in that vague process are getting sad about it. It's also obviously being labeled a war in Western media. You will rarely find it being called anything other than that or conflict. But I, along with a bunch of Holocaust survivors and scholars and members of human rights organizations and academics and healthcare workers operating in Gaza and really anyone that's been to Gaza and the International Court of Justice, which determined that South Africa's case accusing Israel of genocide was plausible, issuing provisional measures in order to prevent this plausible genocide, which Israel has failed to adhere to in any meaningful sense. This group of people and organizations is willing to call this a genocide. And then on the other hand, you have uh, the Israeli state and certain random divorced internet celebrities. <laughs> Who's to say which side? is correct. But regardless of how you feel, while I'm going to read the CNN article as it calls it a war, it is, from my perspective and others, a genocide. A lot of us are very scared of getting drafted again into a war in Lebanon, an IDF medic who served four months in Gaza told CNN. A lot of us don't trust the government right now. Israeli authorities, with rare exceptions, have closed off Gaza to foreign journalists unless under IDF escort, making it difficult to capture the full extent of Palestinian suffering or the experiences of soldiers there. Israeli soldiers who fought in the enclave told CNN they witnessed horrors the outside world can never truly comprehend. Their accounts offer a rare glimpse into the brutality of what critics have called Israeli Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's forever war and the intangible toll it takes on the soldiers who participate. So we're already off to a very odd start. Um, glimpses into the experiences of Israeli soldiers have been offered quite a bit by the soldiers themselves. When they post photos and videos of themselves on social media, dancing to music as they destroy buildings, rifling through and defiling the homes that they have damaged or destroyed, and playing with the children's toys, or rifling through their clothing to wear women's underwear. Getting a look into the experience of Israeli- And by the way, this isn't uh, specific to the IDF. There are stories like this about all military around the world. The U.S. has stories like this. I think we all infamously remember the Guantanamo Bay pictures that came out. So this is not new. This is something that is universal to the human condition. Every group will have photos like this. So just keep that in mind, right? soldiers is actually so not rare that there's a document of over 10,000 Israeli war crimes that have been committed on camera. And the reason we have these is because they post them on social media. Al Jazeera recently released a, an excellent documentary on this subject. I would recommend watching that. But even if this weren't the case, if nobody had phones there and they weren't posting this stuff, yes, it is difficult to get information from on the ground because Israel also keeps assassinating journalists, specifically targeting journalists and their entire families and killing all of them in this genocide. I have seen so many journalists on camera reporting that their own family has died. Like the journalists will be talking and then realize as they're reading the report, like they're talking about their own family's home. I have seen journalists after journalists get killed, TikToker after TikToker, anyone who's trying to tell this story. Um, I even heard a story about an American Palestinian that reached out to Israel for help to get out of Palestine and Israel just bombed that particular location. That's what I've heard, can't verify it, I wasn't there. But there are absolute case after case after case where that's why, you know, I don't know if people understand that governments around the world are absolutely not okay with what Israel is doing, right? Like, you have to understand that around the world, country after country is coming out saying like, hey, bro, you need to slow the fuck down. And so right now we're up to head. This is a political stalemate in a lot of ways where nobody knows how to exactly navigate America, helping and backing Israel. But this is why we're hoping that maybe the change of office election is coming up. Maybe Kamala will do a little bit different when she's in office. Probably not, but that would be the hope. And even Barack Obama in the book about the Hundred Year War was mentioned as, you know, kind of a hope for a lot of Palestinians, but it ended up being sort of hand tied through the whole process of even happening out, helping out Palestine. 
So just a reminder, right, that what is happening in Palestine is not okay. Nothing is okay about it, especially with the way that they tell the story. So remember, we are listening. We are, Noah is moving us through a CNN article about how devastating it is to be an IDF soldier because you'll get PTSD, which swings back to the Frogan comments about soldiers getting PTSD, right? And swings back into this idea that we are sending our soldiers, American or Israel or whoever, into war in which now they have to live with what they've done, all in the name of what? All in the name of what? If you care about military soldiers, stop sending them into an unnecessary war to kill civilians. Take care of them when they come home. Give them housing and education. We are literally setting up our soldiers for failure by sending them into places to kill people they were they should never have come in conflict with. Aside, we've seen the most journalists killed in a conflict in modern history. And we do have so much footage of these atrocities, both from the victims and from the perpetrators. So just imagine how much worse things are on the ground, given that Israel is so murderously restricting the people's ability to cover what's happening, to tell the truth about this. For many soldiers, the war in Gaza is a fight for Israel's survival and must be won by any means. Yeah, I mean, that kind of goes without saying, right? What they mean by any means is murdering a bunch of children, blowing up hospitals, destroying everything in sight. That's what that means. But the battle is also taking a mental toll that, due to stigma, is largely hidden from view. Interviews with Israeli soldiers a medic, and the family of Mizrahi, the reservist who took his own life, provide a window into the psychological burden that the war is casting on Israeli society. Sorry, but just if you're aware of what's going on, this is just, do Nazi soldiers need better help? Could our genocide be more efficient if we just went for a morning walk every day to improve our mental health? Mizrahi and by the way, can I just, to bring out my Jordan Peterson, the Nazis suffered! The Nazis suffered! Like, the Nazis did suffer. Hitler put into motion a situation where as a German, you had no choice in many ways but to participate in the genocide of millions of fucking people. And a lot of those men did suffer. All because your governments suck. Your governments fucking suck. And the fact that we're not allowed to say that, and it doesn't mean that you're not without accountability because you're a military soldier. Lots of military soldiers also choose to go to prison for not engaging in these activities, right? So like, Again, time and time again, zoom out of your own fucking bubble if you can. I know it's hard. I get it. I really mean that empathetically. I know it's hard because you have to deconstruct everything around it. People are suffering, whether they're in uniform or civilians, but you are sending these uniformed men into these situations. And then they come back and you want us to give them all of the love and support without acknowledging what your patriotism has done to civilians around the world. And it feels a little bit disingenuous, right? This is very hard to comprehend for people. Chris with the super chat says, Cold War veteran. Are you a Cold War veteran? Represent. Thank you for the super chat. So when we have these conversations, we have to acknowledge that it's not a joke what's happening. We joke about it to cope. So much of our life is coping through humor. And we do. We cope all the time. We joke. We make really dark jokes because honestly, it is very overwhelming to remember that, oh my God, look at what we're doing. We're doing it to our soldiers. We're doing it to Palestinians. We're doing it to our people. And then we have the audacity to divide them even further, to, to make us hate each other even further. And for what? Probably money. But money is not the root of all evil. Your ego is. Your fear is. And so here we are. Stop encouraging your kids to join the military just because you want them to get out of poverty. Find another way, okay? Stop encouraging your kids to join the military. It's not patriotic. It's basically signing up for mental health problems and no resources by the end of it. Stop telling your kids to sign up for the military just to win gold stars in your neighborhood. For what? He deployed to Gaza on October 8th last year and was tasked with driving a D-9 bulldozer, a 62-ton armored vehicle that can withstand bullets and explosives. He was a civilian for most of his life, working as a manager at an Israeli construction company. After witnessing the massacres committed by Hamas, he felt the need to fight, Jenny told CNN. The reservist spent 186 days in the enclave until he sustained injuries to his knee, followed by hearing damage in February when an RPG struck his vehicle. He was pulled out of Gaza for treatment and in April was diagnosed with PTSD, receiving weekly talk therapy. His treatment did not help. They didn't know how to treat the soldiers. Jenny, who lives in the Israeli Ma'ale Adumim settlement in the occupied West Bank said, oh, that's great. So not only did they find a colonizing murderer's wife, they found a criminal colonizing murderer's wife because that's illegal. Not that the state of Israel is legitimate by any means, but the West Bank settlements are, you know, illegal under international law. These are the most- Chet says, if people weren't joining the military, there would be a draft. The draft should be illegal. If you can't find people to fight your wars, it's an unethical war. 
either we truly are ready to fight this war. It's like Republicans and, and fucking anarchists who are like, I can't wait for a civil war. I'm sorry, are you a fucking psychopath? Do you want to kill your neighbors? That's what I'm saying. People don't understand what a red flag they, they sound like when people are like, I can't wait for a civil war. I don't want to kill you. Why do you want to kill me? I don't want to kill my neighbors. I don't know why you are like getting wet at the idea of a civil war. Like you want to kill people, bro? You are so delusional about what kind of horror you are wishing upon humanity to say that I can't wait for a civil war. Bro, <laughs> with peace and love, you would cry yourself and piss yourself to sleep every night at what you're about to witness because of what you think this would mean you've watched way too many fucking Mel Gibson movies, way too many fucking Die Hard movies, way too many Liam Neeson movies. You need to fucking slow down. It is not a joke to, to sit here and wish death and destruction on people. Don't be gross. Don't be gross. But yet when people do it, they call it patriotism. Don't be fucking gross most extreme proponents of Palestinian genocide that you can find. When Mizrahi was on leave, he suffered from bouts of anger, sweating, insomnia, and social withdrawal, his family said. He told his family that only those who were in Gaza with him could understand what he was going through. He always says, no one will understand what I saw, his sister told CNN. Jenny wondered if her son killed someone and couldn't handle it. Once again, this is littered with this passive observational voice. Okay, hold on. Chess is just saying find another path is kind of a privileged shake for a lot of us. Yes, we can find another path, but for others, it's the best option for themselves and the people they depend on them. Sure. But then you have to live with the fact that you might have to murder civilians. So if murdering civilians is worth getting out of poverty for you, then do it. No one will understand what I saw. Okay. What would you do, though? You know, that's, I think, the important part, that IDF soldiers, every single one of them, top to bottom, is complicit in this genocide machine. It's just a matter of how you chose to contribute. Mizrahi drove the bulldozers. And what does that mean? Well, we'll, we'll see. Okay, so in this article, the very next thing you see is an image of the Shujaya neighborhood completely destroyed. Absolutely stunning, the contrast here. Some guys are really sad. Unrelated photo, this is what they did. This is the results of their actions. This child walking through the destroyed remains of his neighborhood. He's in the photo, but we didn't reach out to him for comments. It's just whiplash, dude. It's mm. fucking insane. He saw a lot of people die. Maybe he even killed someone but we don't teach our children to do things like this so when he did this something like this maybe it was a shock for him so when she says we don't teach our children to do things like this if she's referring to killing palestinians then that's not exactly true later in the same article they cite a statistic that a year after the october 7th attack only six percent of israelis think the war in gaza should be stopped due to the great cost in human life the pay attention to this due to the great cost of human life this is what's at stake here human life seventh attack, only 6% of Israelis think the war in Gaza should be stopped due to the great cost in human life. The vast majority of Israelis do not give a fuck about dead Palestinians. So why is this person acting like volunteering for the military to go kill them is any form of contradiction whatsoever. It's mm. not. It's built into the society. Guys, it is. And it is. That's where my empathy comes out. My empathy does come out when I know, and I know this is the bubble take, and this is why I think bubbles are so important. I have a lot of empathy for people that have been indoctrinated into patriotism who think this is what patriotism is. This is what's good. This is what a good person does. This is what a real man does. Uh, my heart goes out to you. It does. But that's why I say the benefit of popping the bubble is recontextualizing perspective. But I can't ask the world to do this when all of human civilization that we know of was built off adhering to these bubbles. And everybody lives in a bubble. I live in a bubble. You live in a bubble. We all depend on perception. And a bubble is just the perception in which we comprehend ourselves and others. So we are all limited, all of us, me, you, your mom. I saw her last week. She says, hi, listen to me when I say this, okay? There is a time to be empathetic to military soldiers, but it's not in comparison to the people they have bulldozed over. Isaac and Mizrahi's friend and co-driver of the bulldozer provided further insight into their experience in Gaza. We saw very, very, very difficult things, Sakin told CNN, things that are difficult to accept. This is where things get pretty disturbing, so content warning for violence, death, and gore. The former soldier has spoken publicly about the psychological trauma endured by Israeli troops in Gaza. In a testimony to the Knesset, Israel's parliament in June, Zakin said that on many occasions, soldiers had to run over terrorists dead and alive in the hundreds. Everything squirts out, he added. Zakin says he can no longer eat meat, as it reminds him of the gruesome scenes he 
witnessed from his bulldozer in Gaza and struggles to sleep at night, the sound of explosions ringing in his head. When you see a lot of meat outside and blood, both ours and theirs, in quotes, Hamas, then it really affects you when you eat, he told CNN, referring to bodies as meat. So this is the most freakish thing I've ever read in an article. What he's Bro. describing here is torture and execution. There's a plethora of evidence of footage and images of the results of what he's talking about. Perhaps one of the more famous cases of the um, flattened remains of a Palestinian man run over alive by one of these Israeli bulldozers. And in the images, you can see that his hands are still zip tied. There was also, of course, Rachel Corey, the American peace activist who, while protesting the destruction of buildings in Gaza by the IDF, was killed by a soldier driving one of these same bulldozers. Some Israelis celebrate on this day every year by making pancakes with Rachel Corey's face painted in To them. These are indescribable atrocities, and yet this article is centering the trauma of the perpetrator. Not just the trauma, but how it affects his appetite. Like, what the fuck is this, man? And again, with the totally passive language. These are gruesome scenes that he witnessed from his bulldozer. He's just sitting on the bulldozer and it's doing it on its own. It happened, and the bulldozer is what did it, and he watched it from atop the bulldozer as it was doing it, but it was something he witnessed. Also, I want to note the article's edition of Hamas in parentheses there. I don't know if the person said this or if CNN added it. This is the lie that the terrorist state of Israel must perpetuate because we know who's dying. It's not Hamas. It's Palestinian civilians. It's overwhelmingly women and children. He maintained overwhelmingly. Humans are so capable of so many things. So just a reminder, getting pissed at Frogan for making a sassy joke or a sassy statement, even though she clarified when this is what she's consuming and this is what we are saying. You have to understand the context of these things. That like there are disgusting things being but this is, this is the problem. So now you zoom out. You zoom out even more. Regardless, these pancake losers, I don't want anything bad to happen to them. Because that's not going to help anyone come back from the dead. Like, it's not going to help anyone come back from the dead, right? It's just not. But that is the way I would not talk to that person ever again, bro. Like, that is not helping. That is not harm reduction. Okay? That is not harm reduction. I want nothing bad to happen to those people, but that is not harm reduction. That is not good. There's just nothing about that that's helpful. Now, Frogan, it's not that her joke was helpful, but I don't think in that moment it was out of context. Like, I think it could kind of just make sense for the context, right? Now, if Twitch wants to ban her for that, which apparently they did not, that's also their prerogative, their private business, right? So you can do whatever you want with that information. Contains that the vast majority of those he encountered were terrorists. The civilians we saw, we stopped and brought them water to drink and we let them eat from our food, he recalled, adding that even in such situations, Hamas fighters would shoot them. Really? Attacking people that are just trying to get some food? Come on, guys. That's really bad. That's really Hamas of them. Eyewitnesses on the scene have told us that Israeli tanks as well as drones opened fire on this crowd. So there is no such thing as citizens, he said, referring to the ability of Hamas fighters to blend with civilians. This is terrorism. Okay, so now we have a little insight as to why the Hamas label was added. It's because there's no citizens, right? Another genocidal lie that they have to tell themselves that their leadership tells them in order to continue with this project. When soldiers do encounter civilians, however, many face a moral dilemma, according to the IDF medic who spoke to CNN anonymously. There was a very strong collective attitude of distrust among Israeli soldiers toward the Palestinians in Gaza, especially at the outset of the war, the medic said. There was a notion that Gazans, including civilians, are bad, that they support Hamas, that they help Hamas, that they were hiding ammunition, the medic said. In the field, however, some of these attitudes changed. When you actually see Gazan civilians in front of your eyes, they said, you know, I don't believe this for a single moment, but even if it were true, whatever attitudes may have changed in the minds of these soldiers have resulted in what? Nothing. Nothing has functionally changed. They are still committing genocide. They are still posting about it on TikTok. Our country is still unconditionally supporting it. And the only reason this line is being printed into a major publication is to, in some small ways, obfuscate all of those facts. The IDF has said that it does all it can to minimize civilian casualties in Gaza, including by sending text messages, making phone calls, and dropping evacuation leaflets to warn civilians ahead of attacks. Despite this, civilians in Gaza have been repeatedly killed in large numbers, including when sheltering in areas the military itself has designated as safe zones. So look how these two things are presented, right? The IDF said this, the evidence shows that they're actually lying and they're actually murdering a lot of people in some of the most heinous ways possible. Those are just two- I agree, Chet says this is Vietnam all over again. I do think this is just, this is gonna, and people called it like a year ago, like people called it the moment October 7th happened. They're like, dude, this is, and it is, okay. We're like witnessing history, but we're always witnessing history, right? Like we're always in history, all of us. And look, we're not going to be remembered. No one's going to remember us, but history will remember this moment. 
And it will be, I think, a deep regret of many people. Remember that like Hitler had his fun time for like five years before the U.S. intervened because it became a problem for us, not because we're some moral, amazing people that went in to save the Jews. It's all about politics. When it interests us, we'll get involved. When it doesn't, we're happy to let people be slaughtered. And in some ways, politically, fine. I can make, again, I'm very good at bubble hopping. If you want me to think of it only from a political perspective, I'll give you what the answer is because politics is about winning. If you want me to give you the moral answer, then no, this is immoral. This is immoral. The dilemma is that morals are subjective. And so we have to have conversations with that awareness. But people think God made them. They think the universe brought them here. They think, you know, like magic, you know, brought them into existence. They think they might be in the matrix or whatever else. It's like all of these, all of the issues that human beings have is sort of like self-created because we, again, we put like we create these constructs and then we add this meaning to them. And then we decide we have to live and die by this construct. But it is what it is. So then that's why my work is centered around the individual not feeling crushed under the weight of this realization because I know it can be overwhelming. Like when I watch these videos, I, I really, I'm a crier. I cry at 9-11 videos. I cry at Palestine videos. I cry at October 7th videos. I cry at videos of people being hurt very easily. My partner always tells me, stop thinking about sad things, but it's very hard when I'm like doing this for a job. And then I'm like, re and then I do it on my free time. My mom said this since I was a child. Brittany would read about somebody in a different part of the planet and just start crying for them. I, how could you not? Because I, my brain, I don't know this is a universal experience, but my brain can really imagine being that person. So then my brain is like, I start to feel a tightness in my chest and I start to feel like this overwhelming sense of pain. And then I have to realize like, regardless of the chaos around us, we can be good people. So many people are being bulldozed right now and they will not become cruel people. There are Palestinians right now who will remain good and, and lovely and compassionate people, even while they are suffering. And those are the people that I want to make sure that I, that I focus on of like wanting to be that. I want to be compassionate even when the world isn't being. Right? <laughs> Chess says, Bernie, I thought you were a boy. Boys don't cry. Well, this boy does. Okay. This boy cries, okay? Two perspectives for you, the reader, to consider. Anytime you see, well, here's what the IDF said. It takes one search to find out that all of this is a lie. The mental health toll in Gaza is likely to be enormous. Relief groups and the UN have repeatedly highlighted the catastrophic mental health consequences of the war on civilians in Gaza, many of whom had already been scarred by a 17-year blockade and several wars with Israel. In an August report, the UN said the experiences of Gazans defy traditional biomedical definitions of PTSD. Mm. Hold on, sorry. Chad says, I never really cried because it felt intrusive and violating to try and involve myself emotionally into other situations without being a part of it. I think like the great philosopher Toto said in JJK, it is offensive to make the tragedy about yourself. So without making the Palestinian struggle about yourself, make it about the humanity of it all. It is not wrong to cry over other people's pain, right? But it is wrong to cry and make it about your pain. You are not the one suffering. That's why, um, that's why Ethan was so frustrating because it felt like he was making it about himself. Like you can be in pain and not make it about yourself. And so this is a thing you must do. That's why I usually kind of do this stuff in private and I, you know, I do what I can on stream, but I try to like focus the energy on them because, you know, even if you're being overwhelmed, it's not about me. I'm a privileged American living in Europe right now. Like, I'm not in this conflict. I'm not being impacted by this conflict. I have friends, I have connections who are being impacted, but like, I'm not being impacted, but I am being emotionally impacted by the human suffering. But that's, that's my business. That has nothing, I don't want any resources going to that, right? And it's, it's kind of that kind of thing where you can cry without making it about yourself, you know? TSD, given that there is no post in Gaza's context. I mean, this line is just, 
chilling, an outright admission that the suffering will never end, that this is genocide. This point just gets dropped in the article and then it's immediately followed by turning back to the mental health of the person doing this, right? The IDF soldier. After Mizrahi took his own life, videos and photos surfaced on social media of the reservist bulldozing homes and buildings in Gaza and posing in front of vandalized structures. Some of the images, which were purportedly posted on his now removed social media accounts, appeared in a documentary that he was interviewed for on Israel's Channel 13. His sister, Shur, says she saw a lot of comments on social media accusing Mizrahi of being a murderer, cursing at him, and replying with unpleasant emojis. It was hard, she said, adding that she tried her best to overlook it. I know he had a good heart. Oh my god, dude. Unpleasant emojis. That... That's what we're talking about? That's what was hard to you. You know, when you say your brother had a good heart, you're wrong. He didn't, and neither do you. Because what the fuck are you talking about? He posted war crimes. They don't list the document. You know, that's so subjective too. Like, do you have a good heart? I think even villains cry over their loved ones being killed. That's why a villain is never just a bad guy. There's no such thing as a bad person. There's only people who do bad things. And bad is subjective based off the experience. Like, I don't fully believe in that idea. I don't even think you're your thoughts. I don't think you're your actions. I don't think the who you are, the real you, has anything to do with what you do. It has to do with the relationship you're having with what you do. And that's a very different experience. And again, that's like a very big philosophy idea. So that's maybe it's hard for people to have that conversation in these moments because we just judge people on what they do. But I try to judge people on the relationship they're having with what they do because I think that's more honest. I think the real answer is in there. And look, for thousands of years, we've been discussing like what is love? What is righteousness? What is justice? What is good? What is bad? And we're just another part of the population having that conversation, right? Like we're just another part of the population having this conversation and then we're going to die and no one's going to remember us. So this is for us who are alive right now. We're not doing anything for future humans. We're doing it for us. So for the next 70 years, we can have somewhat of a good life because we're going to have to live through this, right? Chet says, at some point, I would love to hear your take on what happened to Liam Payne. Um, could you go into that a little bit more? Because I don't know what to say about it, right? I've looked it up. Uh, just looked like a guy who had mental health issues and used drugs to cope and then died, right? So I'm not sure. I wasn't a One Direction person, so I don't know much about them. Is there something specifically? Because I'll cover it. I just don't know what specifically there's to say about it. Documentary by name, they don't link to it, but all it takes is one search. And yeah, this guy was a freak. He was posting the same shit that makes it into all these documentaries that, of war crimes. <laughs> Is that their, is that their, like, chant cries? This house is for you, all of you do for us? Singing Yale Gollin song? I don't know what that is. Come on, take it down. Clearing dead people with debris. Aaron Bregman, a political scientist at King's College London who served in the Israeli army for six years, including during the 1982 Lebanon war, said the Gaza war is unlike any other fought by Israel. It's very long, he said, and it is urban, which means soldiers fight among many people. The vast majority of them are civilians. Bulldozer operators are among those who are most directly exposed to the war's brutality, Bregman said. What they see is dead people and they- Okay, hold on. Let me give an example that might help. Uh, someone in chat said Liam was exposed for ex uh, abusing his ex a week before he died. So let me give you the same example. Saying Liam, which I've seen, people said like, oh, he deserved to die. He was an abuser is exactly what Frogan is saying about military soldiers. You deserve the PTSD. You're an abuser. I think it's ugly. I think it's wrong. But I can see why they think that. Lots of people think things like that. Literally. I will. I will. The con this is such a normal take from people. I don't know why we're shocked by it. It's the, what I'm offended by, not literally, but what I think is worth observing is the fact that people are pretending to be offended at Frogan. When they know they say the same shit all the time. If you're offended at what Frogan said, then you better be offended at like so many other things everybody's saying on the internet, right? But like, that's a very normal, normal reaction. Like, oh, fuck Liam, he was an abuser, he deserved to die. Oh, fuck the military soldiers. They like kill civilians. They deserve PTSD. It's like a very human perspective to say things like this. Not good, but too common for me to believe the people are actually mad at her. It's just too common because I usually get, people are usually very upset at me. People will make whole videos about me because I will say things like, you shouldn't say this about people. And they're like, what the fuck? Like, I will say like, eh, this is my line. People literally think I'm like, 
some kind of weirdo because I'm like, nobody should kill anybody. They're like, what, Brittany? We have to kill people. What do you mean we shouldn't kill people? Like people have the audacity to literally challenge me on whether or not we should kill people. So I know you can't be that fucking offended because the same people that think it's crazy that I'm completely anti-violence are the same people advocating for violence when it's convenient. So y'all better make a decision on when you think it's okay. We all have a line in the sand, right? So make sure you know your line and then do what, you know, do with that what you will. And these are, by the way, great first date questions. Great first date question. What would you do if we had a trans kid? How do you feel about the IDF? Great first date question. How do you feel about Palestine liberation? Great first date question. Really tells you about a person. You know what I'm saying? clear them along with the debris. They go over them. Again, this violence is framed as somehow being imposed onto these soldiers, these terrorists. They were exposed to the brutality. They see dead people treated completely like the laws of nature, like an inevitable reality. For many, the transition from the battlefield back to civilian life can be overwhelming, especially after urban warfare that involves the deaths of women and children. Sorry, let's get a rewrite on that. For many, taking a break from committing genocide can be overwhelming, especially after entering into a concentration camp to repeatedly murder women and children. That's what's actually happening, but it's here summarized as a really tough time for these guys. How can you put your children to bed when, you know, you saw children killed in Gaza. You saw it. You saw it. It just happened. I saw it. I don't know who did that. Despite Mizrahi's PTSD, his family said he agreed to return to Gaza when he was called up again. Two days before he was meant to redeploy, he killed himself. In her home, Jenny has dedicated a room to memorialize her late. I wonder if he was given the option not to redeploy if they would let him for his own mental health. Because I wonder if he just couldn't go back to there, which a part of me tells me like he must have like he must have really struggled. The fact that your military soldiers are committing suicide instead of going to therapy is a problem. That's a problem. The fact that a victim of October 7th killed herself is a problem, right? Like, that's a problem. And it needs to be figured out. But if this military soldier genuinely didn't want to go back, would he have been called a pussy for not wanting to go back? Would he have been jailed? Or would he have been given an opportunity to be like, what we're doing there is not okay? Because I don't know why he killed himself. But it sounds like he wasn't given the option not to go. Eight son, with photos from his childhood and working in construction. Among the objects his mother has kept was the cap Mizrahi was wearing when he shot himself in the head, the bullet holes clearly visible. It then shows an image of Mizrahi as a child. This is obviously meant to invoke some sort of sympathy for this person, but all I see when I look at this picture is a reflection of one of the tens of thousands of children that this person grew up to participate in killing. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz reported that 10 soldiers took their own lives between October 7th and May 11th, according to military data obtained by the newspaper. Asked by CNN about the number of suicides in the IDF since the war, Uzi Becker, a psychologist and commander of the IDF's combat response unit said the medical corps is not allowed to provide a figure and the military sees the suicide rate as largely unchanged. The suicide rate in the army is more or less stable in the last five or six years, Bekar said, noting that it has in fact been falling over the past 10 years. Even if the number of suicides is higher, he said, the ratio so far is quite the same from the previous year because we have more soldiers. It doesn't mean that there's a trend of more suicide, <laughs> Becker told CNN. So I don't believe this for a moment Damn, because well, they don't show the statistics and it is within the IDF's interest to maintain. A you know, every time I watch an anime and I see a building go down, I think how many people just died in that i always like i say it out loud as if i'm saying something interesting but my partner's always like probably a lot i'm like how many people just died like how many people did these people just kill having this anime fight in this fucking scene in this anime and then you see shit like this and you're like i wonder how many people just died i wonder how many people just died because what you're supposed to be focusing on is like the cool fight or like ooh, the big explosions um a bunch of people just died bro you know, yes, okay, you guys do the same thing. I'm bro, I do it every time. You know, in the Digimon movie, when they're fucking fighting in the streets, I'm just sitting here like, yo, a bunch of people just got trampled on by these like Digimon, bro. These people will be, these people will be dead. All these Marvel movies, all these things. And we're just doing it in real fucking time. Look at us facade of strength. And no, these soldiers are not strong. They are notoriously weak, actually. Incompetent pussies who hide behind screens and murder children from afar with Xbox controllers. But if evidence did come out that they actually were killing themselves in droves, that would at least be a sign that some of them do have enough of a conscience to see that the actions they've taken in Gaza are deserving of punishment in some form. And on the inverse, if it is true... If Ooh, I don't believe in punishment. I don't believe we should punish people. I think you can hold people accountable without punishing, torture or anything evil being done. I think it genuinely makes you a bad person causing harm onto people who have done bad things. I think it's a net negative. So I don't think we should punish people. 
I'm I take a very strict stance on this. You can be held accountable without being tortured. Yes, glad you did a reference to the Digimon. Guys, I saw the Digimon movie in theaters like 15 times. My mom would just drop us off to the cheap theater and we would just watch it. I've watched that movie so many times in my life. I love it. The soundtrack, everything about it. It's so good. I cry every time. I cry every time. Okay. <sighs> yes, Fishy. Fishy says punishment is a cycle. It really is. It really is. The IDF soldier suicide rate hasn't changed. I feel like that's a grim sign. A sign that despite the total murderous rampage they've gone on oh, since October 7th. I just saw this video on TikTok. I just saw this video. And then people in the comments were like, this video looks fake, bro. Scooter says, how do you feel about punishing entities like governments, Brittany? I don't believe in punishing people. Punishing people is a very specific. I don't believe in hitting your kids, right? Because it's a punishment that doesn't. I don't think you should punish your children. I don't think you should punish people when they do bad things. I think you need to create an infrastructure that keeps them from hurting other people and or creates a pathway for like um, rehabilitation, right? Like we have to either rehabilitate or believe in humanity or we have to keep them in safe facilities away from other people so they don't hurt people, but not torture them. Guys, I am terrified at a senior citizen homes. I'm terrified at like places for people with disabilities. I'm terrified about mental wards. I'm terrified about anywhere where people dehumanize other people because they think they deserve it. You don't deserve it. Nobody deserves anything. So to say like you deserve to be punished, you don't deserve anything. It's an entitlement that makes you think you're allowed to punish people. And I am terrified of family members. I remember when my friend was going through psychosis, it was during lockdowns and we were trying to figure out if we should take them to a facility. And I was with their family at the hospital and the doctors were talking to us about our options and a doctor pulled me aside and said hey look if your friend gets sent to the psych ward you won't see them they'll be locked away they're already paranoid it's weed and it's probably the weed i don't know what it is yet but whatever you do is if this lady comes into this office and you talk to her they're going to take your friend away and no one's going to be able to see them for like three four days because we're in lockdowns so we can't have visitors and they said the only facility that's available in your area is one who's known for very bad reputation, like very bad reputation. Okay. So then I was like, okay, my friend's fine. We're going to take them home. Like, we're not going to talk to anybody. So we didn't talk to anybody. That doctor pulled me aside and gave me like the DL and the DL warned me. We took my friend home and we talked to a bunch of doctors, a bunch of medical professionals, you know, we, we did our best to figure it out. And we ended up finding the right doctors who could give them the right medication, who after enough time, they came out of their psychosis and they're perfectly fine. But regardless of when, like there's a balance between reaching out for help and accidentally doing the wrong thing because the people who are in charge of you might not look at you like a person. There was a high probability that my friend who was already in psychosis, who was already paranoid that the government and all these conspiracy theories were coming into their head because of the weed and dose psychosis, that taking them away, imprisoning them and putting them in a facility would have made it a thousand times worse. But that is what people, that's the option people have, or they can take them home and try to do it a different way. Right. And so again, there's like a fear element of when do I trust my doctor and when don't I, I trust the people that on the DL pull me aside and say, Hey bro, your, your friend's going to get taken away. I would take them home. Better for them to be at home than in a facility where you can't see them. You don't know what's happening to them. You don't know who's touching them. You don't know what's going on. And it's just better if you take your friend home. So it's like, okay. Yeah, let's go. Right? Let's go. Chess says, didn't you say you spanked your siblings as kids? Did your view change? Uh, I don't think I ever spanked my siblings. To my knowledge, I don't have any memory of that. I spanked my nieces and nephews. And yes, my view did change on that. And my view did change on that. Yeah. But like, I didn't spank my siblings. You know what I mean? But yeah, my nieces and nephews and my view did change on that. I just realized like spanking is just, it's, it's never reasonable. No matter how much you logically tell yourself you're not doing it out of anger, you're doing it because it makes sense. It just doesn't. I don't mind a two finger tap. Okay. I don't mind a two finger tap like this. Like, no, because that sends the message, but like uh, spanking on the bottom 
you know, threatening, like, I'm going to tell your dad on you, all of that. Nah, that's, that's just, that's unhealed shit right there. You know, it's unhealed shit, bro. Okay. Let's see. Um, uh, and welcome to memberships. Abby says, what are we ought to do instead of punishment when there is wrongdoing as a society? Okay. Just a reminder that I do not answer questions for society, right guys? Like I cannot, I don't, I'm a fucking idiot. You're a fucking idiot. What do we know about fucking society? Like, who do we think we are to decide what 350 million people should be doing in America? What the fuck? Like, why do we even think we can answer this question? What can we truly, what knowledge do any of us have to truly answer this question? It's a good question. So I'm, I'm glad you asked it. But wh what gives us the idea we could answer it? What ego do we have in our hearts that thinks we know what's good th for 350 million Americans or for societies in general? Like, that's the question we should be asking ourselves. Not what should society do, but why do we think we have the answer for society? Why do we think we know what's good for people? That's really the question we should be asking ourselves. Because this will stop us from implementing rules on society that we think is good for them through our ego. It will force us to be, okay, where's my humility here? Why do I think I know? Why do I think I know what's good for all of these people? What, what entitlement do I have in my ego that's telling me, oh, yes, I know? That's, that's really the, the question I think this channel should, should promote us thinking about, right? Because this is a philosophy channel. Okay, let's go back to the video. I'm so sorry. Here we go. Consciences have somehow adjusted to rationalize it. And that's a troubling thought, you know? Becker, the IDF psychologist, said that one of the ways the military helps traumatized troops resume their lives is to try to normalize what they went through, partly by reminding them of the horrors committed on October 7th. This situation is not normal for human beings, Becker said, adding that when soldiers come back from the battlefield with PTSD symptoms, they ask, how do I get back home after what I saw? How do I get to engage with my kids after what I saw? We try to normalize it and to help them remember their values and why did they go there to Gaza. For the tens of thousands of Israelis who volunteered or were called up to fight, the war in Gaza was seen not only as an act of self-defense, but as an existential battle. That notion was touted by top Israeli political and military leaders, as well as Israel's international allies. Yeah, it was a good versus evil, remember? The children of light versus the children of darkness. They were all pretty clear about their intentions from the jump. So here we go again with these monsters having to tell themselves stories, having to remind themselves of the narrative that nothing could ever justify October 7th, but October 7th justifies everything. Anything you did, just remember what happened and all of it's washed away. You're absolved of your sins. Super important to note here that this is the power of spreading misinformation that demonizes not just Palestinians, but Hamas in general. The amount of in misinformation that was spread about October 7th, you know, claims of 40 beheaded babies, claims of mass campaigns of sexual assault, all of which were proven false. We can in this article see- Uh oh, this is what Hassan was saying and everybody was mad at him. So now Noah Sampson is saying it and giving resources. This is what we're trying to say. We're trying to say, did you fall for propaganda or was it happening? And how was it happening? So Ethan would see this and say, oh, Noah Sampson, an anti-Semite. He's denying the rapes. But we're saying they were proven false, that it wasn't a mass situation, right? That like what you're what, like a lot of information came out and who knows, right? Like who knows exactly what was happening when there's too much bias and prejudice happening. It's very easy just to believe everything that you read, but this is why there's differing opinions on the situation. This is why Hassan is frustrated with Ethan because Ethan and Ela keep saying, Hassan is denying the rapes. Hassan is denying the rapes. The organizations are denying the rapes. Like the rapes being used on mass or like in, this, in the way that it was contextualized through the media, right? So again, like you're doing this thing where you're getting angry at streamers or YouTubers, but like the entities are giving the, the organizations are the ones giving the information. Be mad at them. Because what else are we supposed to go off of, right? We were, we're not there. One of the results of such propaganda, which is a direct motivation for them to continue the genocide. These guys are downing themselves and the IDF's therapists are using debunked New York Times articles to revive them, to keep them going on their killing spree. Netanyahu has described Hamas as the new Nazis and US president. This is interesting that they're calling Hamas the new Nazis. That's really, really interesting since eugenics played a, such a huge role in Nazi propaganda and America and Israel have both engaged in eugenic oriented conversations. So I just think that's really interesting. I haven't heard a eugenics perspective from Hamas or Palestinians yet. I don't know if they're collecting sperm from dead soldiers to keep their bloodline going. I haven't heard that from them, but maybe. 
Um, okay, let's keep going. I've read it. Oh, sorry. Ch who's this? Chimsaw man? Today's my 30th birthday and I'm spending it broadening my horizons at the feet of the modern philosophy queen. <laughs> Stop it. Thank you. Happy birthday, bitch. Happy birthday. President Joe Biden has said that the ancient hatred of Jews endorsed by the Nazis was brought back to life on October 7th. The external threats to their country unified many Israelis, putting on hold domestic political squabbling that had for months divided society. Meanwhile, the suffering of Palestinians has largely been absent from Israeli television screens, which are dominated by news about the hostages in Gaza. After the Hamas attacks, polls showed that most Israelis supported the war in Gaza and did not want their government to halt the fighting, even while negotiating to release the kidnapped hostages. On the one-year anniversary of the October 7th attack, a survey published by the Israel Democracy Institute found that only 6% of Israelis think the war in Gaza Gaza should be stopped due to the great cost of human life. And that's really common. Most Israeli people believe, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in Zionism. Most want an Israeli state. Chat says, isn't an ethos state eugenics in and of itself? I think the uniqueness of Israel is a little hard to comprehend. I think all I think I'm deeply confused by it, if I'm being honest, just because like there's too many layers. I don't know how to say it without I don't want to like accidentally dog whistle here. I'm just trying to say it is a little awkward, I think. Israel's desire to desperately hold on uh, in a way, oh, this is so hard to say. See, I see everyone always says like, oh, you can say whatever you want against Israel. But like, I think you, you have to be careful on the internet. I just want to say from a humanitarian perspective, I, it's just a unique situation. I don't know any other country. I don't understand how it works. I don't understand a person having like a state or like a place that's specifically about your bloodline. Like, I don't know what's happening. I'm like a little confused by it. You know, true. Chat says Nazis got eugenics from the USA. That's true. That's true. That's why I'm saying like, uh, I don't know. Like this whole idea. You remember when 2010 YouTube was happening and everyone was talking about IQ and eugenics. I'm so, I don't care about any of this stuff. I don't care about bloodlines. I don't care about IQ. I don't care about... I don't, I don't get it. I don't care. I don't get it. I think people are people no matter who you are. So I, I guess I'm just like a little confused, I think, about the idea of the purpose of like Zionism in general and the purpose of this whole situation being what it is. I don't know. This is another unfortunate oh, reality of the situation is that Israel as a society is sick to its core with dehumanizing anti-Palestinian racism to where all the political conversations about Netanyahu and internal government affairs are all centered around Israeli society itself and the hostages. The hostages being the ones that the IDF itself keeps killing. The genocide doesn't factor into it in any way. Most of the world has caught on to what's going on here. Most of the world's countries have condemned it. Most of True, the world true. This is very important to pay attention to because if you're an American getting American propaganda, you won't know the rest of the world is like incredibly deep been like incredibly on the side of palestine that's the problem with american media is like just so you know when people say like oh you're being so un-american right now like ethan said to hassan america does not represent the globe most people are pretty fucking upset with what's happening between israel and palestine world's countries have called for a ceasefire protests against the genocide are some of the largest we've seen in decades and still just six percent give a fuck about the monumental loss of palestinian life some soldiers however couldn't rationalize the horrors they had seen when he returned from gaza mizrahi often told his family that he felt invisible blood coming out of him his mother said sheer his sister blames the war for her brother's death because of the army because of this war my brother is not here maybe he didn't die from a bullet in combat or an rpg but he died from an invisible mm. bullet she added referring to his psychological pain this is the lengths to which supporters of this genocide will go to rationalize what happened they will make ghost stories stories about palestinian ghosts bullets from an enemy that doesn't exist well i think the sister if i take her for what she's saying i think she's blaming israel for his death not palestinians right is noah saying that she's blaming palestine because i'm blaming israel she sounds like she's blaming israel let's let's listen to that again to his cycle from a bullet in combat the war for her brother's death because of the army because of this war my brother is not here maybe he didn't die from a bullet in combat or an rpg but he died from an invisible bullet she added referring to his psychological pain this is the lengths to which yeah isn't she saying that israel killed her brother am i dumb supporters of this genocide will go to rationalize what happened they will make ghost stories stories about palestinian ghosts bullets from an enemy that doesn't exist. The only reason I'm wasting my breath on this story is because of how heinous of an example it is of the willingness of Western media to frame perpetrators of a genocide as victims. The prominent voices in the West do not see Palestinians as human and do not take seriously the violence enacted upon them. The war criminals perpetrating their genocide are given infinite. I mean,
mean, I think that's true that in general, the article was sympathizing with the Israeli soldiers that killed Palestinians. But I think that, oh, let's see. Chat says, I think she's trying to say that Israel is implying that Palestinians killed her brother. But the truth is Israel killed her brother. I think that I'm going to take it like that because I'm but I am I am agreeing that the CNN article and the way they're framing this story is to empathize with the Israeli soldiers without taking into consideration Palestinians. But I think just that one quote from the sister sounds more like she's blaming Israel, but I'm not sure. Right. I'm not really sure. Infinitely more sympathy and coverage and airtime than any single Palestinian victim. It's repulsive. It makes me sick to my stomach. I hope it makes you feel the same. And I hope it makes you angry because it is so profoundly unjust and evil. And I hope you can harness that anger into productive ways like uh, volunteering, donating, and protesting because that's unfortunately all that we can really do. I've linked below a GoFundMe for uh, someone I met on Instagram, someone that I would call a friend, Ahmed Matar, who's organizing a fundraiser for his brother, Salah, and his family. His wife, Islam, and their four children, Sidra, Muhammad, Amir, and Tagreed. I'm just going to go ahead and read. Oh, you know what's crazy about about Palestinians, do you know they still have to go to work and make money to feed themselves? Like, do you know the cost of flour went from $4 back to $17? And do you know when they work, they can make 2 to $5 a day? But listen to me when I say this, they still have to go to fucking work. So like, put that into perspective. Your house has been decimated. Infrastructure, gone. And you still have to fucking go to work to feed your family. The price of food has gone up. They're look, people are still selling food. Like, I don't think people are processing that what's happening in Palestine. So if you're, as an, you're like in Israel right now, going to work and hanging out with your friends and doing whatever you're normally doing on YouTube, enjoying the internet, Palestinians are trying to figure out how to fucking feed themselves who have been decimated by this war because they still have to exchange money for goods. That's why getting food and water to them is so important. But that's not what's happening for people. So just like to put it into perspective, okay, they still have to go to work somewhere where there is no work, of course, because what who sometimes they can do farming and they can do um stuff like that. But so just think about that's why people are raising money for GoFundMe's and stuff, because they need to still eat. So just to put it into perspective, because I know some people are like, why do they need to go fund me? Because things still cost money. People are still charging people. All right. The message that uh, Salah wrote. The journey of our youngest, Tagreed, began amidst the chaos of November, during the peak of the assault on Gaza. It was a time of great fear and uncertainty. We found ourselves displaced for the second time, seeking refuge in a shelter where Tagreed came into this world. His birth brought both joy and worry, a tiny beacon of hope amidst the darkness Habibi. of war. Once, the northern part of Gaza was our home, where the sea breeze carried the scent of olive trees and the laughter of our children echoed through the streets. But the violence of war shattered our peaceful existence, forcing us to flee not once, but four times. Each displacement brought new challenges, pushing us further into the unknown. Now, we reside in Rafah, a borderland caught between two worlds. Our home is a tent pitched on dusty plains near the Egyptian border. It offers little protection from the harsh realities of life in a war-torn land. Every day is a struggle to find clean water, food, and basic necessities. Diapers for Tagreed are a luxury beyond our means, and we often must ration what little we have. Despite the hardships, we cling to hope for a better future. Your support can make a world of difference for us. With your help, we can evacuate to Egypt, where safety and stability beckon on the horizon. Your donations will also provide essential supplies like food, clothing, and medical care for my family. Furthermore, your contributions will assist us in rebuilding our lives by helping us purchase clothes and other essential items that we lost in our destroyed home in the north of Gaza. Your generosity offers a glimmer of light in the darkness, guiding us towards a brighter tomorrow. Thank you for your kindness and compassion. Together, we can turn our struggles into stories of resilience and hope. That's it for today's video. Let me know what you thought. Okay. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on here, and it's way more than we can even comprehend or handle, but it is just another perspective onto why Frogan would say something like, I hope you get PTSD. Because with CNN covering stories about this, they're making it sound like we're not allowed to be mad at the people that participated in the action. And I get it. A lot of U.S. military soldiers have regretted the kids they've killed in Iraq. I know some of them personally, you know, that they've said, like, you don't understand, you know, when a bus full of kids is coming at your base and driving at your base, you have to blow up the bus full of kids because there's probably bombs on it anyways. And I'm just sitting here thinking, like, Jesus, like, this is the best we can do as a fucking superpower. And that's just like humans are going to human no matter what. And it's not perfect. It's not like one side bad, one side good. It's more like humans are humans everywhere. No matter who you are, where you go in the world, humans are humans. You know, what's the justification I keep hearing from people is like uh, if Palestine had the power, they'd be doing the same thing to Israel. And that's what all of life is built on. I have to destroy them because they do it to me. But you're not better than them. You're just doing what they would do in a different timeline. You're not better than them. 
So the irony is like we had to do it or they do it to us. That doesn't make it different. You know this, right? Because if you're saying that's what they would be thinking, then you're still not the good guy. Like you're still not the good guy in the story. Okay. All right. So. All right. That's out with that story. I'm going to go to a different story now. If you guys have any questions or comments, do them now about the subject matter. Then we'll go to an Andrew Tate story and then we'll go to a story from um, kind of related to. Um, oh, my God. My brain is just absolutely cooked. Holy fuck. You guys sent me a video you wanted me to watch. Uh, oh, my God. Why am I forgetting his name? D'Angelo Wallace. You guys sent me a, a video from D'Angelo Wallace you wanted me to watch. OK, so we'll do that. Chess says, is there a good guy in any story You, if you are always the bad guy in someone's story? I think it's all about perspective. I think good guys are bad guys and bad guys are good guys. I think everybody is everything. Now, I think there's a spectrum to within reason, outside of reason. And again, it's all about that harm reduction. How much harm are you costing? And then you have to kind of weigh it against that. It's like, it's like homophobia or transphobia. Like I remember when JK Rowling was stepping into her transphobia and I was giving her a chance because I'm a big believer in chance. And I'm like, hold on. She's just, she's testing the waters of her transphobia. Maybe she won't go full turf. And now did you guys see her? She's a part of the LGB group and she's like advocating for basic, she's full on, full blown turf. She's been a turf for like a couple of years, obviously, but it's just like, you can't, this is who she is. She is a transphobe. And it's like she is causing so much more harm than good. And she is the bad guy in a trans person's story. She is. She is the bad guy in a trans person's story. And she is the good guy in a turf story. But I think the harm she is causing is too great in comparison to the good she thinks she's doing. And I think that that is what's fascinating about experiencing people together because at one point JK Rowling was a hero to a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. Right. And now, well, she's just the bad guy to all those people with all those different backgrounds. And it is what it is. So I think she is causing more harm than good. But she is the hero in someone's story. I think she's just the villain in more people's stories. Chat says, so maybe if you're like the good guy in more people's stories than you are the bad guy in people's stories, then you're doing okay? Probably. Something like that. It's not, I don't believe in black and white thinking. <laughs> as much as I'm a nerd divergent queen, I actually do try to stay away from black and white thinking. But something like that. I think so. Which is hard because depending on who you talk to, and that's what's so like complex about the human experience. There's like, there are so many good examples of this, of really hor horrific people doing horrific things um, who also have parts of them that are just so loving. It's hard to see them as the bad guy. It doesn't mean they're not. It just means it's all about that perspective. And again, for me, I try, I try not to overreact. I try to be very grounded in my judgments. So I tried to say like, I don't need to freak out over what people are doing to the best of my ability. When I'm medically triggered, triggered, it's one thing, but I'm not medically triggered most of the time, maybe once or twice a year, <laughs> but like, you know what I mean? So if I'm in the most grounded perspective, then I think I am able to react with, okay, I can see that you're saying that. Let's kind of work together to, to mitigate that harm. And that's the problem. People aren't coming from that perspective. They're freaking out. People are freaking out and then you have to calm them down and then you have to come up with a solution. But people are using their freaked outness to justify their reactions. I, you're allowed to be freaked out, but I don't think you should make any decisions while you're freaked out. It's kind of like, don't make any permanent decisions after 2 a.m. Nothing good happens at 2 a.m. And nothing good happens when you're dysregulated. Don't make any permanent decisions when you're dysregulated. Wait until you're calm. 
you know, that's, that's really, that's really what I would suggest personally. Let's see. Discord says in 20, uh, the 2010 IQ arrow, uh, per was particularly funny to my brain. Girl, do you remember stiff St Stefan Molyneux or whatever? What a piece of crap. Love him. Just kidding. Don't love him. But you know what I mean? Like <laughs> all humans are beautiful, <laughs> but oh my God, his content was the most brain dead. Chats or Discord says went to high school with Charles Murray's son. His son would lay down in class and lick the floor. What the fuck? His dad was treated like a serious researcher by some, but it always felt to me like he was coping. His kid was really smart, just like there were other obvious issues going on. Oh, just felt like there were other issues going on. And leading into IQ makes people superior in a way to deny that. That's crazy, bro. Oh, man. 20, 2010 YouTube was was crazy. You know, I don't know how you guys feel about it. I don't think now is more divided. I think 2010 YouTube was hard. It was very, it was, I think it was rougher than it is now. And just a reminder, the internet is not America. It is a global entity. So when you see opinions from people on the internet, it's not going to always favor America. You're, the world isn't obligated. Americans aren't even obligated. We have free speech. We're not obligated to like America. That's the glory of America. We actually have free speech. We can say shit about our own country, right? We, we have a lot of free speech in America. Just a reminder, parts of Europe do not. There are already things in Croatia that like very strict on, which is fair. I, no problem. I, it's not gonna, it's gonna be more than easy to adhere to their laws. Germany, very strict laws about free speech stuff. You can't just be, you know, like a Nazi in either of these places. Any, in any Nazi propaganda, you are in trouble, sir. In America, we protect Nazis. We are so free speech. Like it is an insane, like very unique place. So in some ways it's like the most free place. And in some ways it is incredibly backwards. And that is the conundrum of everywhere we live. Right. That is like the conundrum. It's so it's, I love it. Like it's so interesting. Humans are so interesting. I love us. We're so fascinating, you know? I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Done.